Divers! It is Tuesday. It is September 29th, 2020. And thank you for joining us here on Facebook Live. Excellent. It is a gorgeous day here in South Florida. We had amazing conditions out on the water today. And uh, we're super excited to uh, continue our festivities of Shark Month here in September with a great presentation. Uh, we've got the manta rays of South Florida with Jessica Pate, and uh, I'll introduce her a little bit later, but let's just do some housekeeping. First, let's see who is on checking us out today. Say hello to us. Type in the comments section. Let us know that you're watching and where you're watching from. We love seeing um, where we're reaching because uh, it's not just here in South Florida, but we noticed that we're getting people from all over the state and even um, in other states and sometimes even other countries. So we like to know where everybody's listening in from. And uh, we also, if you're enjoying the presentation, you can see that you can hit the little thumbs up button, the smiley face or the heart emoji. And that lets us know that you're really enjoying this presentation. And we all want to thank, thank you again for tuning in because we know that today is that presidential debate. So who, who wants to watch that? Nah, let's watch about the manta rays, right? <laughs> um, all right, guys. So if you have not registered for tonight's event, you need to make sure to go to www.force-e.com, go to the event page, go to the event tab, drop down, and then click on the Manta Rays of South Florida Facebook Live and register on our event bright. And the reason why you want to do that, that's going to give us your name and your email address so that you can get in on the drawing that we have later on after the presentation, we're giving away either four air fills or two nitrox fills to the winner. So you have until 7 p.m. to go and register on that link uh, to be able to get into the drawing to get uh, the four air fills or the two nitrox. So yay! Um, all right, people are typing in. They're coming in from all over the place. Thank you all, guys. We appreciate the support, and we hope that you guys are staying safe during this time, um, and hopefully you guys are getting out there and diving. I know that the conditions have been either spot on, beautiful, or they've been really, really uh, rough seas and bad viz, so it's kind of a hit or miss, but you know that's the way South Florida is uh, sometimes here in the fall. And uh, you know what? When we have those good days, let's get out there and go diving. Give us a call. We'll get you out there on a boat. We'll get you out there on a shore dive or at the Blue Heron Bridge. Um, all right, guys. So a couple of other things. This is a double header this week, meaning tonight is a shark slash manta ray presentation. And tomorrow we have another one. That's right, guys. We have the guys, the uh, ladies, uh, sorry. Uh, Jillian Morris from the Sharks for Kids organization. She's going to talk about shark superpowers. That's going to be really cool. So make sure you tune in tomorrow as well. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, let's get started. We've got Jessica Pate here. And she is going to talk about her research of the manta rays of South Florida. Hey, Jessica. Hey, everyone. All right. Are we good to go? You're good to go. Everyone's tuned in. All right, um, let's see. So, hey everyone, I'm gonna be talking to you today about the mysterious manta rays of Florida. My name is Jessica Pate. Um, and I'm gonna start off telling you guys about general manta ray biology, what is a manta ray, um, and why they're my favorite animals and why they should be your favorite animals. And then we'll talk some about um, my manta research in Florida and how you as divers can help us learn more about manta rays. So the first thing people notice about manta rays usually is their large size. Manta rays can get really, really, really big. Um, their disc width, which means from one end of their pectoral fin to the other end of their pectoral fin, can be seven to eight meters for the largest ones. So in feet, that's about 23 to 25 feet. So they can get really enormous, as you can see this big manta ray here in this photo. Look at the diver's arm is pretty much the size of one of their pectoral, or not pectoral, pelvic fins. Um, and manta rays are part of a group of animals called elasmobranchs. 
And elasmobranchs are the group of animals that make up sharks and rays. And what make them different from animals like us is that they have skeletons made out of cartilage. So it's made out of the same material that's in your ears or the end of your nose, which is really great for living in the water environment because it makes them really bendy and flexible and hydrodynamic. Um, what cartilage does not do very well is it does not preserve very well. So to see something like this, a manta ray skeleton on the bottom of the ocean floor is very, very, very rare. Um, so what we don't see a lot is manta ray fossils. Um, but one thing of manta rays that does fossilize is their teeth. So manta rays have a row of teeth on their lower jaw. These teeth are really, really, really small and they have thousands of them. And they don't use them for feeding. We'll get around to what they use them for later in the presentation. Um, but these teeth are made of very similar material um, that our teeth is made out of, so they do fossilize. And what they found is that manta rays um, are pretty young when we're talking about evolution. So when we talk about all of the lasmobranchs, they've been around for about 400 to 450 million years. And manta rays have been around for 5 million years. So they're the most uh, recently evolved ray. So they're kind of the newest rays that um, are living in our oceans at the moment. Um, and I'm going to go over really quickly what the difference between a stingray and a manta ray is, because this is the ray that most people are probably familiar with. If you go to an aquarium and there's a touch tank, or if you go for a snorkel offshore in Florida, this is the ray that you're likely to see. Um, so these rays are identified. Um, are adapted for living on the seafloor. Their whole body is adapted for living a life on the bottom. They have eyes on the top of their head so that they can see above. Their mouth is below so they can eat things out of the sand. Um, their gills are also below their body. Um, and that's why they have these holes in the behind their eyes that are called spiracles. And this allows them to pump water over their gills while they're laying in the sand. Um, they also have a stinging barb on the end of their tail that helps protect them from predators coming from above. Um, a manta ray has a very different lifestyle than a stingray. Manta rays are built for swimming and they live within the water column. So manta rays have to continue swimming in order to breathe. Um, the stingrays, like we said, have those spiracles that they can pump water over their gills. The manta rays, they have them, but they're not functional anymore. They mostly close up after they're born. Um, and instead of having eyes on top of their head, they have eyes out on each side. This helps them see both above and below them. And they have, um, more of a diamond shaped body that's uh, very hydrodynamic for swimming. And they also do not have a stinging barb like the stingrays. So there's no way a manta ray can hurt you. And their mouth is actually right in front of their um, body instead of located underneath. And <clears throat> when manta rays um, are feeding, they unroll these fins that are in front of their face, which are called their cephalic fins, they unroll these fins and they can um, channel or funnel all of this plankton rich water into their mouth. So they use these fins to funnel all this plankton rich water into their mouth. And what happens is this is a close up of the structure of their gills and they have <clears throat> structures on the gills that capture all this plankton within the gills and let the water flow through. And then when they're all full, they can swallow the plankton. So manta rays are filter feeders, much like um, large whales and whale sharks. Um, and when manta rays are done feeding, they can roll up their cephalic fins, um, which makes them more hydrodynamic. And this is why in a lot of places in the world, you'll hear them also refer to as devil rays because it kind of looks like they have two devil horns.
And I have a video of one of our Florida mantis here rolling up his cephalic fins. So that's what we, they do. And we actually see them do this a lot in response to us being in the water. So it's also possible that they maybe use these cephalic fins in communication. All right, we're gonna talk really quickly. We have two different species of manta ray. Um, my colleague, Andrea Marshall, who founded the uh, Marine Megafauna Foundation was the one to describe these two species in 2009. Before then, all manta rays are all around the world were considered to be a single species. Um, so now we have two species, the giant manta, Mobula barostris, um, which is the larger manta ray, and it's considered to be a more offshore, located in open ocean habitats, and the reef manta, Mobula alfredi, which is slightly smaller, but it's still really big, um, and they're associated with more coastal reef habitats. And so I'm gonna teach you how to tell these manta rays apart from one another. Um, they look very similar on first glance, but once you get the hang of it, you can really quickly tell who is who. So you can look at the shoulder patches. So manta rays are dark on top with these white shoulder patches. Um, I can't use my cursor on this, but if you look at the black area in between the white shoulder patches, on the giant manta, it makes a black T. And on the reef manta, it makes this kind of curvy Y shape, or I kind of think it looks like a, a funny mustache. That's one way to tell the difference. The other way is on the giant manta, you're only gonna see spots in the very center of the belly underneath the gills. And in the reef manta, you're gonna see spots all over the body. And in general, the giant manta has much darker shading than the reef manta. And remember I said they don't have a stinging barb like stingrays do to sting you, but giant mantas have this little remnant spine. So it's no longer functional, it's not gonna hurt you, but it's basically a spine in this like calcified bony mass. And the reef mantas have completely lost that. So the giant manta, this is a map of their global distribution. Basically, they're found all around the world, mostly in tropical and subtropical waters, um, but they're also found in temperate waters. Um, they've been found quite far up the east coast of the United States. Um, and this is the global distribution for Mermobula alfredi, the reef manta. They're more associated with the east coast of Africa, Asia, and Australia. And what we think is that there is a third species of manta ray, which would include our Florida manta rays, that would be endemic to Florida and the Caribbean and the Western Atlantic. So that's something that MMF is currently doing work on at the moment. So I don't think I have a way of hearing you guys, but maybe you guys can type it in the comments. Um, can anyone tell me what species the center manta is? Is it a giant manta or a reef manta ray? Anyone? All right, well, it has <laughs> spots all over its body and not very dark shading. So this middle one is a reef manta ray. Actually, all the ones that make the center T are reef manta rays, and the ones on the outside corners are, oh, yay, Christy, Lauren, and Libby all got it right. Nice work, ladies. Um, and the ones in the outer corners are giant manta rays. You see this dark shading. The spots are only in the center under their gill, uh, gill slits. Um, and what's also really handy for researchers like me with manta rays is they have these spot patterns on their bellies. And these spot patterns are unique to each manta ray individual. Um, so it's very much like a human fingerprint. So I actually came from a background of researching turtles. And in order to track individuals, we would have to put tags on the turtles to know who is who. With manta rays, all I have to do is get in the water with them and get a photo and we know which manta ray it is. So it's really great for doing non-invasive uh, research. 
So I'm gonna show you guys this really cool video of a manta ray. This is a female manta ray named Mirka. And what's really cool is that you don't often see these interactions with fish in the ocean where they come up and inspect you and kind of actually initiate an interaction with you. We'll see mantis do this where they flip upside down and they can see you better like that and they'll check you out. So why might a manta ray be <clears throat> exhibiting this curious behavior? Um, one thing is we think manta rays are really smart. Um, they have the largest brain of any fish. So they don't just have a large brain because they're large animals. They have a large brain for being a large animal. It's the largest brain of any fish relative to their body size. And so this leads researchers to think that they might be quite intelligent. But why does a manta ray need to be intelligent and put all this energy into having a big brain? Might it be because they are filter feeding and need to find plankton. They're roaming across these oceans and maybe having a big brain helps them find food. Well, if we compare that to the whale shark, which has a very similar feeding strategy to the manta ray, the whale shark is 10 times the size of a manta ray and has a third of the brain size. So it, it might not be that. What's more likely is that it's because manta rays are very social animals. Um, and this is an extreme example of their social behavior in the Maldives and Hanafaru Bay, um, where manta rays will get together to feed uh, lucratively. Um, this type of feeding behavior is described as cyclone feeding, where they basically make a tornado of manta rays, which funnels all the plankton um, kind of into the center. And basically, by stacking on one another like this, they're kind of they're managing to scoop up all the plankton together. And this is not my footage. I have not been here. I would love to go. I don't know if any of you divers have been there, but um, I'm jealous. Um, you'll also see this barrel roll feeding behavior when they do backflips. They usually do that when they get in like a nice thick patch of plankton and they want to stay there and continue to see food on it. Um, but we also see this cooperative feeding behavior. This is actually in Florida, taking in the intercoastal of Boynton Beach. Um, and if you watch this social behavior of the manta rays who are feeding together, this is my favorite part where they turn right here at the exact same time. So likely it's these social relationships or why manta rays have big brains. And one of our researchers at MMF just published a paper this year um, on reef mantis in Indonesia, finding that females actually form long-term social bonds. So there's a lot more to learn about it, and it's very, very interesting. All right, now we're going to talk about manta mating behavior. Um, but first, I want to talk to you or go over how you tell the difference between a male and a female manta ray. So we have a female manta ray on the right. Um, you can see these pelvic fins. There's just two pelvic fins and that's it. On the left, um, you will see a paired structure that are on top of the pelvic fins. And this is a male manta ray with claspers. And <clears throat> we can use the relative size of these claspers relative to the pelvic fins to determine about how old or what um, age class a male manta ray is. So this male manta ray in the top left corner in uh, picture A is a juvenile male. The claspers are very small and don't extend past the pelvic fins. In B and C, these are subadults, um, so not fully sexually mature. Um, and in D, this is a fully sexually mature male. The claspers extend well past the pelvic fins. They actually harden when they're uh, sexually mature. They'll calcify. 
And you'll also see um, these round clasper glands that are right on top of the claspers. So when we're doing our research, we usually look at these claspers to see how old the manta rays are. All right, so we're gonna talk about how manta rays mate. So they actually have some very, very cool mating behavior, um, which usually starts out with what's called a mating train, which is where we have one female who is pursued by multiple males. This can be as little as two up to 20. And basically she will do elusive behavior where she backflips and curls around and all the males will follow her around the reef. This can go on for hours. Once a male, whoever I don't know, or we don't know how the female selects which male she's ready to mate with, but once that happens, um, if we're looking at the picture in the top left, the female is on the bottom and the male is on top. So the male will kind of get on top with her. If she's not receptive, you'll see them kind of like buck the male off. So the male gets on top, and if you look at the picture next to the right, and he'll work his mouth down her pectoral fin. And for some reason, it's almost always the left one. Um, he'll work his mouth down her pectoral fin, and if you see in the bottom two pictures, he'll bite down on that left pectoral fin. And this is why the manta rays still have teeth, is because so they can grab on during this... Um, mating behavior and he'll put a lot of that pectoral fin in his mouth till he gets a really good grip uh, once that happens he will use that grip on the pectoral fin to gain purchase and kind of flip him and they will mate belly to belly when he inserts one clasper in so um manta rays are negatively buoyant which as divers i think we all know that means that they sink um, so once they stop swimming, they begin to sink. So once they start mating, they start going down to the bottom. So after all these hours and hours, sometimes a courtship behavior, mating takes about 20 to 30 seconds. Um, it's very rare to witness it. Um, and then the male will swim off. The female will be left with these scars on her pectoral fin from the male's teeth. And this is one way that we can know if a female is sexually mature and engaging in mating behavior. Then the female will become pregnant. You can see her distended belly and it'll also be distended on the back. Um, and female manta rays are pregnant for about one year. So they're pregnant for 12 months <clears throat> and then they have one baby. And then they take a break of two to five years between every pregnancy. So female manta rays have one of the most conservative reproductive strategies in all of the sharks and rays. They reproduce very, very, very slowly. And um, why is because they're putting a lot of energy into one pup. So when the pup is in utero, this is what a manta fetus looks like since they're so big. They have their pectoral fins folded over their back like a little um, manta burrito. And so that's the only way they'll actually uh, be able to be small enough to be birthed. And they come out with mantas, like little mantas ready to go. Um, they don't get parental care. Uh, their mother has put enough energy into them. So no one has ever seen a manta ray birth in the wild. So no one knows where manta rays are born. Um, but the only place this has been observed is in Aquaria in Japan. Um, and they've been able to measure the mantas. And the mantas at birth are five to six feet across. So these mantas are, you know, the size of a full-grown human when they are born. Um, they're really large. Um, both species of manta are considered vulnerable to extinction. And what vulnerable to extinction means is that, you know, if current trends persist, um, they're likely to become in, uh, extinct within 100 years. So this means that we need to do something and stop the current population trends in order for mantas not to go extinct. Um, and a lot of this is because of their really conservative life history strategy like we talked about they reproduce very very slowly so 
if populations are depleted, it takes them a very, very long time to recover. Um, some of the threats to manta rays are entanglement and fishing line. Um, remember I said manta rays have to keep swimming in order to breathe. So if they get trapped in something that makes them um, unable to swim, especially like a gill nut or something, then they will drown. Um, there's also what I call the kind of typical suite of threats that are affecting almost everything in the ocean. Um, coastal development and pollution can destroy their habitats. Microplastics are the same size as the zooplankton that they eat. Um, so they can be ingesting this and this might be blocking um, their digestive tracts. Climate change may be altering the food they eat. Um, and we also see animals with vessel strikes. But by and large, the biggest threat to manta rays are fisheries. Both unintended catch, which is called bycatch, and targeted fishing. Um, this is actually, this picture was taken from a market in Indonesia, which now manta rays are protected in Indonesia, so this isn't as prevalent. Um, <clears throat> But manta rays um, are targeted for their meat sometimes, but also they're targeted for their gill plates. So remember I told you in their gills, they have these structures that catch the plankton and filter it out. Um, manta rays are harvested for their gills, um, and these are sold in Chinese medicines. Um, they can get, I think, like, up to 400 US dollars for a kilogram. So fishermen can make a lot of money off these gill plates. Um, and there is no you know, scientific proof that these uh, are effective or have any medicinal properties. <clears throat> so now we're gonna switch uh, topics a little bit. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and how I got interested in manta rays. And I actually got interested in manta rays um, when I was studying sea turtles. I moved to Florida whew, over 10 years ago now uh, to work on the sea turtle nesting beaches. And if those of you are familiar with that in Florida, we ride the ATVs up and down the beach and count the tracks from the sea turtles who came up to lay their eggs the night before. And while I was out working on the sea turtle nesting beaches, I would sometimes see these large rays swimming right by the beach in three to five feet of water. And I couldn't believe that we had manta rays in Florida and that no one had ever mentioned it to me before. Um, so being a scientist, I did what scientists do, and I got on Google Scholar, which is nerd Google. It'll show you any scientific publications, and typed in Manta Ray, Florida. Um, and this is the only paper that came up, which this was true until a couple weeks ago, um, that the only paper, the only paper on Manta Rays in Florida it was just a paper that said that they had seen three manta rays in the Indian River Lagoon in the 1990s. Um, so that was the extent of the information I could find about manta rays in Florida. So, oh, actually, there are a couple of, uh, I'm going to use scientific in quotes, articles from the very early 20th century that have to do with manta rays, but mostly hunting manta rays. I don't know if anyone... Can anyone tell me who this guy in the picture is? Does anyone know? I'll wait a second and see if anyone can type it in the comments. Well, this is actually one of our US presidents. Yes, Libby got it right. Nice work. Yes, this is Teddy Roosevelt uh, with two manta rays that he harpooned. So um, this is mostly, there's a couple of writers who wrote about harpooning manta rays in the early 20th century. Um,
but that's kind of the extent of the knowledge there is out there. Um, so I decided to start the Florida Manta Project to learn more about these manta rays. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we study them. Um, we go out on a boat and look for manta rays. Um, this is actually how we used to do it, where I would stand on the bow of the boat at the highest place, and I would look for these dark shapes swimming by. Um, and I like to joke that I've identified every single manta-shaped rock in Palm Beach and Martin County. Um, I believe that to be true. Um, but we're looking for these black shapes that move. Um, now we're doing a lot more with drones um, than just looking with our eyes because it's so much easier to get a wider view with the bird's eye in the sky. So we're looking for these black swimming shapes and when we find one we get in the water with it and all this is done free diving. Um, they're, they're much too shallow and fast to use scuba gear with. And we take photos and collect data. So what we're trying to collect are, one, we want to get a photo of that unique belly spot pattern so we can tell which individual it is. Um, we're also getting a picture of the pelvic fins to see what sex the manta is, if it's male or female. We document any anthropogenic impacts or injuries. So you can see this manta ray has a, a fishing lure in her lower jaw, and we also try to um, remove them if we can. Um, and then we collect data on behavior. Are they feeding or just traveling, environmental conditions, and associated species, uh, such as these shark suckers that are with this manta ray. Um, and yeah, one thing I want to say is that I have um, some very good friends and my boyfriend who are uh, professional photographers and take beautiful photos like this that I use for my presentations um, and that I use for social media. But that is not what it looks like 95% of the days because um, everyone wants to come out and do this. But a lot of times the manta rays are skittish and in crappy water and a lot of times this is what we're seeing. <laughs> um, so I just want to make sure, even though I love what I'm doing and it's very cool, it's not always friendly mantas showing us their bellies in crystal clear water. Sometimes it's this manta in Lake Okeechobee discharge water. Um, so our results. So I'm presenting our results that we just published, and these are from our research from 2016 to 2019. Um, so this is not including this year right now. Um, but because uh, I'm analyzing that data as we speak. As of 2019, we had 59 individuals. Um, but as of today, we were out today and found a manta ray, it's up to 86 individuals. And I don't have the number of encounters with me. Um, but that's just going to be about 200 encounters now. <clears throat> And the sex ratio is about evenly split between uh, males and females. Um, an interesting finding is that we're reciting the same individuals over and over again. So in scientific speak, we would say they're showing high sight fidelity. So you can see in these two pictures on the left, this is a male manta ray named Jigsaw. Um, and What's actually really cool, I haven't even announced this on social media yet because it just happened yesterday. This manta ray in the middle, in the top middle and in the bottom middle, is a manta ray named Gilly, who we first saw in August of 2017. We saw him in 2018. We saw him in 2019. And the last time I saw him was in October 2019. And we're kind of thinking that maybe these juvenile manta rays use the area for maybe two to three years. And I'm kind of using him as an example. And he's our most cited manta ray. Um, he's in like all our publications, he's in all our publications and all the figures because we have the best photos of him. And he just showed back up yesterday. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw him. So we haven't seen him in a year and he showed back up yesterday. So. He's um, updating everything we know about manta rays in Florida and how they use this habitat. So it's very cool. 
Um, another big finding is that we found that all males were sexually immature. So they all have these very tiny claspers that don't go past the pelvic fins. Um, and none of the females have mating scars or have shown pregnancies. So all of the manta rays we are seeing are young juvenile manta rays. And here's just kind of a, um, an array of manta claspers, if you will. Um, we're also seeing a lot of interactions or a lot of evidence of interactions with humans and manta rays. Um, what's unique about Florida compared to a lot of other places, like a lot of people know, like go to the Maldives or Indonesia to see mantas and they're on these remote islands. But here in Florida, these manta rays are right up on the beach near big city centers. So they're coming into contact with lots of people. Um, about a quarter of the manta rays we see are within a kilometer of a fishing pier or inlet jetty. So these are areas where we have lots of people and boats. Um, so we see about a quarter of our manta rays with fishing line on them. And a lot of this quarter of the manta rays, we see them with multiple fishing line encounters. This manta ray has two hooks in her, and she actually has another hook on her other side. Um, and the severity of these um, fishing line entanglements can really vary. Uh, the manta ray in this top left photo actually has monofilament that is wrapped through his gills. I ended up just pulling it out because it had gone all the way through. Um, the manta ray on the bottom left has um, fishing line wrapped around her cephalic fin. And this picture we took in 2019, we actually saw her this year and that cephalic fin has fallen off. So she's not gonna be as productive at feeding um, with only one cephalic fin. Um, and this other manta can see on the right side, it's probably suffered a shark bite right there, but you can tell by these um, we see a lot of algae accumulation on the lines, which means that they're probably not, uh, they can be staying on for a long time. And if you look on the manta's bottom uh, part of its body, you can see one of the fishing lines is cutting into its body. So when manta rays feed, they'll do those barrel rolls. And if there's lots of trailing fishing line, they get wrapped around the manta's body. And we'll see this quite often where they make deep cuts into the into the manta ray's body. Um, oh, sorry, this is a warning. This picture is a little gross if you don't want to see this. Um, this is Gilly, the manta I was just telling you about. Um, in 2018, we found him with a very fresh wound from a boat propeller. Um, so what you're looking at here is that deep, big wound in the middle is from the skeg or kind of like the bottom of an outboard propeller. And then you can see the propeller chops on there. And if you actually look underneath that fresh wound, you can see there's another already healed boat wound that he's probably been hit by before. So we saw Gilly on August 15th, 2018 with this uh, injury, and I was pretty horrified. But we saw him again four days later, and this is what the injury looked like. The, the side propeller marks had almost completely healed, and we saw him, I don't have it right in front of me, a couple weeks later, and it was completely healed over. And now you can barely even see where it happened. Another one of our manta rays named Rosa, um, she had a propeller injury to her pectoral fin. You can actually see like the water all the way through that injury um, on her pectoral fin. Um, and we saw her about six weeks later and her injury had completely healed. So their healing abilities are really amazing. And while it's really good, what it probably means is that we're underestimating the amount um, that these manta rays are hit by boats. Because once they heal, the scars can be really difficult to see. So if we're not seeing these injuries when they're pretty fresh, um, we're probably underestimating the amount this happens. And if you're wondering how it happens, we see a lot of manta rays either 
feeding at the mouth of inlets. And in some of these inlets, they're using the current um, to kind of rest and relax in. It's really hard to watch this with the drone. Sometimes I sit on the edge of the wall and um, yell at the boaters, tell them to watch out. Um, so what all of this means is that the fact that we're seeing almost exclusively juveniles and um, that they're sticking around this area for a long time and using the habitat across years is that this is a nursery ground for manta rays. So this is a place where young manta rays can develop into mature adults. And we're seeing this, this nursery habitat, we're seeing a lot of effects from humans because they're so near, you know, these millions of people in South Florida. Uh, we recently had this work published. So now if you go to Google Scholar and type in Florida manta ray, uh, this is what it says now. Our paper comes up, urban manta rays, potential manta nursery habitat along a highly developed Florida coastline. Um, this is available to the public. Um, so if you go online and search for that or let me know, um, I, there's you can get a PDF copy of it. Um, this is a copy of our paper that was published in Endangered Species Research. And we also got some really great coverage in National Geographic, which was pretty cool. Uh, marine biologist dream. Um, some other work we're doing in addition to the boat surveys is we're doing aerial surveys. This allows us to cover a larger area than the boat surveys. So we can survey all the way from Stewart down to Fort Lauderdale to understand better how they're distributed over space and time. We're also working um, with NOAA to do some satellite tagging, which will help us understand the characteristics of the nursery habitat, because in order to get federal government protections, you have to show why the manta rays choose this habitat and not some other habitat. So we're working to do some tagging projects. Um, and here's one of our mantas, a juvenile manta ray named Leo. Uh, this is one of his tracks from 2019. We were supposed to do more tagging this year, but coronavirus got in the way. Um, and he was tagged here in Jupiter and went all the way up to almost like off Daytona and then came back down along the coast, spent a while again back in this kind of Jupiter area and traveled all the way down to Miami. So these manta rays are using the coastline wide, widely. Um, and it's going to take us uh, some more information to really figure it out. But they are showing some site fidelity um, to our local area. Uh, we're also doing surveys of fishermen. I think someone wrote how can um, fishermen prevent uh, manta ray entanglement. Um, we're about to publish a paper on this. We went out to piers and inlet jetties and survey 200 recreational shore fishermen. Um, and I have signs in production now. So we're going to have signs to go on the piers to tell people what a manta ray is, because there are some people who are confused between manta ray and stingray, um, and what to do if they see one. And what we think is happening is that most of these manta rays aren't targeting people's bait. It's more that the manta rays are swimming into the fishermen's lines. And most fishermen do not want to catch a manta ray because they are not fishing with tackles strong enough. Um, you know, the manta ray is most likely going to get hooked and run away and break the line and take the fisherman's tackle. So we're going to try to work with fishermen to get them to reel in their lines. If they see a manta ray, usually a manta ray is this, you know, six to 10 foot big black thing swimming on the surface that are very visible. And if they can reel in their lines and let the manta ray pass, um, hopefully we can reduce these interactions and fishermen won't lose their gear. Um, and also we want fishermen to report their manta ray sightings since they're out on the water so much, it can really help us uh, learn more about their spatial distribution. Um, a lot of fishermen, especially up in central Florida, um, if you go to YouTube and type in manta ray Florida cobia, you will find a lot of videos on this, um, but they, fish 
for they use the manta rays to find cobia and they basically cast directly on the manta ray um trying to cast like right in front of its face so that the bait drops down in front of it and the cobia goes to grab it um here in south florida we're really not seeing very many cobia um with the manta rays um but we're going to be doing some work on manta rays up in central florida to see if they're having the um the same amount of fishing gear interactions like they do down here um this is also brand new <clears throat> with funding from the disney conservation fund we just started um an education program which our first pilot effort consists of seven lesson plans for grades three through five um you can find all the information about them on our social media or it's mariemegafauna.org backslash lesson dash plan um and these are really cool. We have them so they meet uh, Florida State science standards as well as national science standards. And they feature real research done by marine megafauna scientists. And I'm really excited about these. So if you have any teacher friends, please, please, please share. Um, they're freely available online. And for all of you as divers, if you happen to see a manta ray um, in Florida or actually anywhere in the world, you can report your sighting to Manta Matcher. If you go to mantamatcher.org and hit this report encounter button, you can, if you have photos, upload your photos. And if you have a photo of that unique spot pattern on their belly, um, you can send it to the researcher and the researcher can tell you if that's a manta ray in their database, um, which is really cool. And it's really helpful to research researchers and conservation managers. Um, an example of this is our team in Indonesia uh, tracked this manta named wallop um, between two protected areas in Indonesia and in Nusa Penida and Komodo. And between these areas, there was a big, um, there's a lot of fishing going on. As you can tell, this wallet manta has a fishing line on his cephalic fin. And based on data from citizen science divers, they tracked wallop's movements between Nusa, Panita, and Komodo over many years. And he kept traveling back and forth and having to go through this fishing zone. And they actually took this data, and wallop and many other manta rays made this migration um to the indonesian government um and now indonesia is indonesian waters are a manta ray sanctuary and they're protected so most of this data was collected by citizen science divers so it really shows how you as divers um by just simply uploading a photo can contribute to real conservation of marine species and habitats um, and if you want to find us on social media, if you want to learn about more specifically Florida stuff, Marine Megafauna Foundation colon Americas. Um, that's where all of our research in North and South America is occurring. Um, you can follow me on at Florida Manta Girl. If you like drone videos of manta rays, then come check it out. And also at Marie Megafauna will be our, that's our global Manta page, which will share things from all our projects all over the world. And www.mariemegafauna.org is our website. You can sign up for a newsletter on our website, which will give you about every month, a little update of all of our research goings on. Um, and a big thanks to all our funders and collaborators as well as all of our wonderful volunteers who work very hard. And thank you guys so much for listening. And I can let um, Manta drone videos play in the background. This is a video of seven manta rays I filmed with the drone right here in Florida. It's sped up. The manta rays are not this fast. Um, or else it would be a 10 minute video. Um, but you can see how they're again uh, all feeding together. And it's really fun. <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining me. And I think Nicole will probably pop on here.
All right, can you hear me, everybody? All right, excellent presentation. <laughs> All right, so we do have a couple of questions coming in for you, Jessica. Um, one, somebody wanted to know if you had like a, a you know, a rough estimate about um, population worldwide of um, how many mantas there might be, and then what what you think there is population in Florida. So that's a great question. I was actually chatting with this with some of our other researchers at MMF who do work in Africa and Indonesia, because we got this question on another Facebook Live. Um, the answer is, we don't know. We need to talk to a bunch of other mantra researchers and everyone put their numbers together. But I don't have the answer to that question off the top of my head. Okay. Um, as far as manta rays in South Florida, right now we've identified 84 individuals. But if you look at a discovery curve, if you've identified every individual in the population, this curve will kind of like level out and show that you've identified every manta. Our line goes straight like this. So we're still finding new mantas all the time. So we have by no means sampled the whole population or we're more mantas are being recruited faster than we can. So I, I don't have a good number for you yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, another question is uh, when you're doing the surveys and you get in the water with them, um, are they really shy and like dart off? Is that a majority of the time or are they actually very inquisitive and let you get close enough most of the time? Uh, they're, they're just wondering like, how easy is it really to approach a manta ray underwater? So it is highly, highly variable. Um, I think these mantas more so than mantas in other populations are pretty skittish. Um, it also depends on how you approach them. If you splash and swim really fast at them, they don't like that. If you approach from behind, they can't see you as well. They like if you approach from the side where they can see you. And also, if you're finding them in the really shallow water, they tend to be more skittish. You know, when they're in shallow water, I think they feel trapped and they'll calm down more once you get out deep. But honestly, it varies from individual to individual. Like Gilly has never really liked us that much. He's kind of okay with us and he just kind of goes about his business and ignores us. But that other Manta who got hit by a boat, Rosa, would literally just like, swim in circles right below us and kind of want to hang out with us. So they have very, like, they have personalities. They're, they're all different. Yeah. Um, and then also, uh, you know, when it comes to getting close enough to them, uh, like the laws, like FWC, like if somebody wanted to try and help a manta ray and like cut a line off of them or something, like obviously you guys do it, but you have parents and stuff. So, like general public, can we be doing that or is that off limits? Yeah, so um, really the only thing we have our permits needed for are putting tags on and taking genetic samples. Just to swim with the manta ray, you don't um, need to have a permit. So if you have shears and you see fishing line, um, you can cut it off if the manta will let you. I think you have to make um, an informed decision about like stressing the manta ray out and getting the fishing line off. Sometimes if they're really skittish, I'm just not going um, to stress them out and get it off. Sometimes the mantas will actually slow down and let you help them. But once you pull on that fishing line, they feel it and they don't like it. So you have to be ready to snip it really fast because you're only going to get one shot. <laughs> And we have to make sure too, you know, not everybody is good at breath holding and swimming really fast. Yeah. You have to look at, you know, your your personal like, uh, you know, skill level. You don't want to, you know, hurt yourself during during that encounter. So absolutely. Uh, so someone wanted to know what is the oddest behavior you've seen? The oddest behavior? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I've never gotten that question before. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, something that I think is really unique to Florida is that behavior where they're sitting and resting in the inlets. I've seen them sit in these inlets for hours with boats, like 
30 boats go right over top of them and they will just sit in the inlet. And I find that to be utterly fascinating, but also very worrisome. <laughs> right. Um, you know, that video that you showed of the drone overhead of that inlet and it just went right over the top. You're just like, ah! like, don't yeah. hit it. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so you, you do a lot of research up in the Palm Beach County. They're asking, um, do you have anybody that you're sending down and looking at in Miami and the Keys? Um, just cause you know, are they only really congregating in the Palm Beach area that you're seeing a bunch of them or what do you No, I mean, it's, I mean, honestly, if I could be everywhere at once where all the manta rays were, I would. Um, we have a lot of people, mostly um, drone pilots who send us their reports from Fort Lauderdale and Miami, but they are, they're definitely down there. And some people have managed to get photo IDs and Gilly has been spotted down in Hollywood. Um, so, yeah. Was, was Gilly uh, reported by the paddleboarder, uh, Kat? No, she's still having trouble figuring out how to get ID shots from her paddleboard. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, if you guys see manta rays down there, please report to them, to us, like, on social media. It's, it's really important. All of the data we get from the citizen scientists is going straight to NOAA to help them spatially model where these manta rays are and what areas are most important. Um, they're also asking, you keep saying about, uh, they're always in the shallow and the shallow. I mean, could they potentially be in deep water or it's unlikely? Yeah, so this is where the satellite tracking helps out because obviously when we're doing our boat and our aerial surveys, we're only gonna be able to see them when they're in shallow water but they are capable of making deep dives. And we had satellite tags on manta rays um, during Hurricane Dorian last year, and they went offshore and made quite deep dives. But we are finding that they're spending the majority of their time in this upper few meters of the water column. Awesome. And uh, one more here. and. Let's go, because it's asked a couple of times by people. They want to know, do you guys have an estimate about how long they live? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, basically, since no one knows where they are born, so we can't track them from birth to death like you'd want to to get an actual lifespan of something. Um, but over in Australia, they have one manta that they have photographically ID'd for almost 40 years and it was sexually mature when they first saw it back in the 1980s. So we think probably like 40 to 50 years is our, our best guess at the moment. So they don't have anything like, I mean, not that you want to go and kill manta rays and cut them open, but like if you did an autopsy on one, maybe that washed ashore or was bycatch, they don't have anything like, tree rings like some other like the fish yeah, have their yeah. um, you have to figure out basically what those rings represent because they represent very different things in different animals um but like manta ray strandings are, are aren't that common like maybe more in like fish markets and stuff but in florida i've only seen one since i've been studying and actually fwc towed it in from the ocean um but um, the manta ray strandings are pretty rare and no one has developed a technique for that yet. It awesome. only really helps if the manta dies and then you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've, we don't like seeing those things, right? <laughs> um, awesome, and, and so just, you know, looking forward to the future for you, like is there certain questions that you're like, you know, I wanna go after these for, for my next portion of my research. Yeah, you're working on the, the you know where the nursery grounds are but is there anything else that you're kind of like got a question and you want to try and research and see what you find oh absolutely one of them if someone actually has a question do rays venture into the intracoastal waterways i know that they do sometimes but i am very curious to see how often this is happening and what they're utilizing the intercoastal waterways for 
what was really interesting is during COVID, um, I got started getting all these reports of manta rays in canals in Fort Lauderdale and Miami, and they were all feeding in there. Um, and it was while we were quarantined. So I think it was because people were home and they'd look outside of their high rise condo into the intercoastal and see a big manta ray out feeding. Um, I haven't gotten any since those like first two months of quarantine, but like that behavior is really interesting. They're in these tiny canals right next to a seawall. Um, <clears throat> so I'm very curious about that. It's just harder to find them in those murky brown waters. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to be expanding our research up into central Florida next year where there's an, more of an adult population of manta rays. And we're going to be looking to see if those adults are related to the babies down here. Actually, we were talking before we started Facebook Live, and I said I hadn't seen any mantas here in Florida. But hello, I'm like one of the few people who saw a manta at the Blue Heron Bridge. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I happened to be on a dive. I think it was like in April, probably, I don't know, six years ago. It was before I had the kid. And so um, I know it was quite a while ago, but um, I happened to be with another diver. And I look up, and there's just this shadow on top. And I'm like, oh, good thing I'm not shooting a macro lens because I was able to get great pictures, belly shots, and uh, video footage uh, of the manta ray that was at the Blue Heron Bridge. And I don't really know if anyone's seen anything since. So. <laughs> if you have and haven't told me, I would be. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, somebody else said they saw they saw a ray at the, at the Blue Heron Bridge. But you might. So a lot of times, just clarify, you guys, uh, a lot of times if you're seeing rays at the bridge, it's usually uh, the spotted eagle rays, not necessarily the manta rays. So <laughs> those are really prevalent there. But yeah, manta rays are very, uh, very far and few to see at the Blue Heron Bridge. But we did see them. And uh, I got it on photo and video. So I, I have proof. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, what I knew back then is I, I didn't know about your project or even if you had started back then. So I, you yeah, know, I didn't, know share it. To, yeah, I didn't know to share it to social media. So guys, Everyone who's uh, you know a local diver here in South Florida, please, please, please uh, go on social media, find Jessica, and uh, she'll also type in her um, email address right now, and you guys can email her photos and uh, video footage so she can add that to her database. So um, I know she would really appreciate that. Um, I don't see, oh, communicate with your guests. I'm typing in my email. Yeah, if you have, like, even if you saw a manta ray 20 years ago, I'd, I'd still be really interested if you have photos or anything like that. I've had one person so far send me some old film photos. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to hide your screen over here, the one that you've got um, with the manta rays in there. There we go. Now there's us. Okay. So now uh, I just want to pull up here. I'm going to pull up my screen because there's a couple of things I just want to make sure everybody knows about. And first thing is, let's see, bring this into the stream here. Okay, so as you guys know, um, Shark Month for September at 4C because, you know, Animal Plan only does a week of it, but we like to do the whole month. So we've had some really good presentations. So you can go to our website, www.org-e.com, go to the event tab. And then also we have a page, it's called Support Sharks. And um, it's basically some great information about what's going on here locally with sharks and mantas. And also, um, we have the SSI Shark Ecology course. And I guess I forgot to put on there, we have a manta ray one as well. So if you guys want to earn certifications um, towards these topics, go ahead and register. Or we have a page, it's called Support Sharks. And... Um, it's basically some great information about what's going on here locally with sharks and mantas. And also, uh, I don't know what's going on. Okay, so um, like I said, we can get you signed up, get those um, those classes going. Also, if you go, we have all, all this cool merchandise that has sharks or mantas on it. And uh, when you spend $50, we send you a free shark gift uh, keychain. Woohoo! So 
Guys, check that out. That's at the 4C website. And also, I told you guys to register. I told you guys to register online because we're going to be doing a giveaway. We're going to do either four air fills or two nitrox fills to a lucky winner. So if you registered on the Eventbrite, I've got your names. I've got them in the random name picker. So we will go ahead and see who the winner is. So let me go back. And actually, Jessica, just so I can make it bigger, I'm going to hide you for a second. Okay, there we go. And, oh, nope, there we go. All right, random name picker. Here we go, guys. I've got everyone's name in there. There it all is. And here we go. Pick a name. Da -da 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 the winner is da -da 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 Gary Shulman. Gary, if you're there, please give us a thumbs up. Give a present, give a uh, comment that you're enjoying the presentation and you're excited to use our um, free air fills. All right, we'll contact you and uh, get you started there. And let me go ahead and hide here and bring Jessica back in. So, hold on, here comes Jessica. And there she is, awesome. All right, and then we've got Alyssa, my little tiny human in the background here. You wanna say hi to everybody? <laughs> Say hi. hi. <laughs> All right. So, guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really do appreciate the support. And, Jessica, that was an awesome presentation. Everybody's raving about it. Um, I think it's just something that not a lot of people realize that's here in South Florida. So, for you to come on, and I know you did a presentation for us in like 2017. and you know, these Facebook Lives, it's its a way for us to get in front of more people so that they uh, know what's going on. Yes, I love you, Mai. <laughs> you love manta rays? Say, I love manta rays. Yes. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs> All righty, guys. Thank you, and have a great evening. Hopefully, you'll tune in tomorrow for our other presentations, Shark love, Superpowers. Welcome with me and the video today. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.